Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks uh, very much for joining this webinar, which is the third and, and final in our autumn and winter webinar series. If you'd like to check out any of the previous webinars that have all had a focus on soil health, then please go to our YouTube channel. We are recording the um, webinar this evening and we'll be sure to send around the, uh, the recording in the coming days. But before we, we get going, I just wanted to touch briefly on Regenerate Outcomes and who we are. So Regenerate Outcomes supports farms to improve soil health through a mentoring program with the experienced regenerative farmers at Understanding Ag. Um, Understanding Ag are, of course, on the call this evening uh, and you'll, you'll hear from them and hopefully get a, a really good insight into the kind of support and advice that the farms we work with receive. Um, from the mentors. The, the, the focus of the mentoring is very much on supporting you to farm in a way that works for you while uh, reducing inputs and uh, increasing farm resilience and profitability. We also baseline and monitor the environmental benefits from regenerative farming to generate uh, new revenue streams for farms. If you're interested to learn more after the presentation this evening, then we're very pleased to share details of the Understanding Ag Soil Academy that's going to take place in May. Um, this is going to be a two day event. Uh, there'll be one up in Northumberland and one down in Oxfordshire. Um, and again, the focus is very much going to be on um, increasing profitability, improving farm resilience and, uh, and reducing reliance on subsidies and inputs. We can, you can expect um, a mix of classroom sessions and uh, and field field walks with plenty of opportunity to um, learn from the understanding Ag understanding Ag mentors and, and and exchange knowledge with other farmers. The soil academies are free for people who are part of the program and 125 pounds for other farmers. I will pop a link in the chat with more details if you're if you're keen to find out more. But yeah, without further ado. Um, for moving on to the reason why we're here this evening. I'm very pleased to present Fernando Falamir, who's going to present on our topic, how adaptive grazing impacts livestock health and behaviour. Um, Fernando is a fifth generation cattle farmer from Mexico and um, and brings, um, brings with him a wealth of experience after farming um, regeneratively for 20 years. Fernando is going to present for about 40 minutes, after which there'll be a good amount of time for some Q&A. Um, it's great that we've got three other Understanding Ag mentors on the call. Carl Richardville, Jeremy Sweeten and Kent Solberg, who's going to be leading the Q&A. And last but not least, our, our special guest, uh, Leanne Oliver, who is uh, a farmer and vet uh, from Northumberland. Uh, she's going to bring her own unique perspective on this topic. So. Yeah, without further ado, thanks very much to our presenters and panelists and, and over to Fernando. Thank you, Jake. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be talking to you guys. Um, a little bit of myself. I'm a biogeochemist, so happen to be a regenerative rancher. You know, we've been doing this for a long time as a family. And my experience comes from a very brittle environment. We uh, I really have a very bad years where we only get less than six inches of rain. That's my average rainfall, six to eight. If we get the average, I'm really happy. Uh, unfortunately, we see changes in the climate that well, are not as conducive to plant growth. But if it wasn't for regenerative practices, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Really, that's what helped us be more resilient. And I'm here to share some of some of that experience and knowledge with you. So let's get going. Can you all see the, the screen? Yes. Yes, OK. So how adaptive grazing impacts livestock and health and behavior um, really is how we manage our pastures will dictate how healthy our soil is and if we have a healthy soil and we have healthy plants growing in that environment inevitably we're going to have very healthy cattle uh, as you can see in this picture if you're doing things right you'll see a shine glow on the cattle's hide 
and you will also start seeing the presence of birds and wildlife, insects, and all, all sorts of uh, array of beneficial um, critters that ought to be part of our environment. And I want to take this time to remind you all of the six principles of soil health. So first is to know your context. Not one farm is the same, even in the same environment. Not every pasture is the same. And we also have to understand what's our position as a business, what's the health of our pastures, and what is it that we're trying to achieve. So sometimes we get a lot of confusion out there on what is best to do. And really, it, the answer is it depends. What are your goals? Second is uh, do not disturb the soil. We really try to avoid any mechanical disturbance. Soil health biology is really brittle. Uh, and if we come in and, and start tilling and, and mow, turning the soil over, then we are destroying the, the house for the soil microbiology to thrive. And that's the source of, of natural soil fertility is that a living soil, a healthy soil is a living soil. Otherwise, it would be called dirt. We also want to maintain and cover uh, the ground at all times. So that armor on the soil, that plant residue that we put on on the top surface, it's creating a buffer zone between the environment and the soil microbiology. It keeps the, the house at a perfect temperature for biology to do its job. And if we remove that armor, we're only going to see detrimental effects in our in our pastures and overall uh, lower production. Four, we want to mix it up. We don't want to have monocultures. We don't want to have just single animal kind of animals grazing. Nature works with diversity. So we want to mix things how we do things. There's not one single answer. Otherwise, it will be a systems approach. Really, it's called adaptive stewardship because we have to be adaptive to the situation and we have to disrupt the system in different forms uh, so that we can drive the ecosystem processes forward. Five, we want to have living roots on the ground. So it's a, the healthy soil, it's a living soil and organisms need that liquid carbon provided from plants that harvest sun energy and make it available for plants. So soil fertility depends on the symbiotic relationships between different microorganisms and living plants. So first and most, we want to ensure that we have living plants. Otherwise, we're not going to drive that system forward. And six, we have to integrate animals into the system. They'll help you cycle nutrients and really drive fertility even further. Adaptive stewardship, I like to call it that way because really we are the caretakers of the land. I want to believe that we are, we can better things how we started it and we're trying to mimic nature in a way. So I don't think adaptive grazing just serves it enough. It's really a stewardship. It's a relationship between animals and land that it's going to dictate how we, how we manage it. And, and how we can improve on these degraded landscapes. The two, three rules of adaptive stewardship is disruption. We cannot leave everything in a static motion. So nature likes that disruption. If you are disrupting too frequently, you're going to have a decrease in, in plant species and, and biology. If you don't create enough disruption, you're not going to see any improvements either. So it's finding that middle ground that it's going to help you uh, move the system forward. Second is the rule of compounding effects. So as we start focusing on, on better plant growth, armoring the soil, it's going to trigger a cascading effects, and these effects can be both either negative or positive. It is up to us on how we manage our resources that is going to determine if it's going to be positive. And third is diversity. The more diversity we have in the system, the better everything is going to function. 
if you apply the six rules that the six principles of soil health and the three rules of adaptive grazing, then you're going to drive the four ecosystem processes forward. And that really is the power of adaptive stewardship. It's how we can affect the environment in a positive way. Here we have an example at the bottom left picture of what a degraded system looks like. That's an overrested land. So even just resting it for extended periods of time is not going to drive the system forward. We need to create that disturbance. And as we create the disturbance, we break up the soil. Uh, we're able to absorb more moisture and we start really benefiting the water cycle. Now, the, the key component in this factor of driving the ecosystem um, processes forward, it's carbon. Really, carbon is at the heart of everything. That picture on the top left on the water cycle, that's our manure strips that I collected from my horses, put them on a manure spreader, and I just made those lines on a contour to try to retain more moisture. And you can see that where there's that carbon on the soil is where you can grow life. So carbon is essential in this system. On the upper right, well, we have energy. So we need living plants to harvest the sun energy. And we have livestock foraging that energy and helping convert it back into carbon to feed the soil. So if you manage your grazing properly by giving ample recovery and grazing events, and you are promoting plant growth, eventually you're going to drive diversity forward. And that is key of the topic of today is that relationship between livestock and our, our grasslands or our grasses and diversity that will dictate if we have a healthy animal or we have a, a degraded landscape that needs high inputs. Because really at the heart of this is we want to wean ourselves from those input costs and we want to be the most efficient producer that we can, the most cost effective. That will help you gain that resiliency and will ensure that you have a profitable business that is sustainable over time. Let's go back to, to this wonderful picture of, of this is one of my cows. And you can see that we have a pasture that is very diverse. We have a lot of people will consider this uh, and they will be scared to see all that brush on the background. But if only you knew that we started from a complete barren landscape and now we are able to grow this amount of diversity in this one place. Um, I think a picture is a thousand words. Just look at the code of this animal. Uh, that heifer, she is completely and amazingly looking. She's healthy. She's foraging on a diverse salad bar. And that's what we want. We we want to create that diversity because it's going the more diverse we have our, our system, the better and the most efficient our nutrient cycling is. And as you improve nutrient cycling in the soil and you build carbon in the system, then you start freeing up nutrients that otherwise would have been tied up because there's plenty of minerals in the soil. They just might not be available for plant growth. So it takes plant diversity and it takes soil diver micro diversity as well to be able to free up those nutrients that are already there. So an improved soil health and increased plant species diversity in our pastures will, will help to bring about a healthy and productive animals. These are animals that rarely ever get sick. I never have a need to go and doctor uh, my animals. They don't need antibiotics. They don't need growth, growing hormones. A healthy pasture leads to healthy and productive animals. Here we have, you can see some of the different species we have. We have, all of these are perennial native species. And we have some bunch grasses, 
we have some sod forming grasses, we have perennial grasses, we have annual grasses, we have forbs, we have weeds, we have shrubs, we have a very complex system that it's working in harmony. Now you may not know this from my friends across the pond, but this bush that you see here, it's a creosote bush. And for a long time, scientists believed that no grass could ever grow where that bush grows because it has allelopathic compounds that deter plant growth from other species. Well, if that's the case, then I don't know what's happening here. So nature is very, very complex. I think we're, we're just starting to, to comprehend what's really happening. And, and that's part of the reason why we focus on I'm doing this. It, that's what drives our passion, is trying to figure out how these complex systems interact and that we take a, an active role in determining if it, we're going to make it better or worse. So it's not the cows to blame, it's us to blame. It's how we manage it. Usually we want to see this. We want to see a nice clean pasture, right? This is a pride and joy of most ranchers and farmers is for people to drive by and look at this. Well, this is a monoculture. A monoculture does not provide the nutritional requirements to promote livestock health, period. You're always going to see nutritional deficiencies in that grass. You're going to have lower bricks context on that grass, and you're going to have lower phytonutrients. I'm going to talk more about the content of those nutrients. But for now, I want you to really engrave into your mind that this is not the picture you want to look for your perfect pasture. Why? If we look at the soil, we can see that there's hardly any organic matter. We do have an attached layer there uh, of some residue that was left over from previous seasons. If you look closely, you can see some clovers wanting to grow through there, but they won't manifest or be allowed to grow because this system, it's always under hay production or it's really overgrazed. Now, because this is an artificial environment with a monoculture and under irrigation, you can get away with a lot of mistakes. If you were in a more brittle, brittle environment, such as my place back home, uh, nature will be a bit less forgiven. <laughs> but I want you to look at, at the soil. It's just clay, looks compacted. There's hardly any roots protruding through the hole that I dug. Uh, you don't see any aggregation at all whatsoever. So we have a, a monoculture that it's anoxic. There's no oxygen in that, in that soil. There's no active soil biology in that soil and that will lead to grasses that are not as nutritious as we would like them to see. In this pasture, uh, the soil organic matter content of that pasture is 2%, so it's, it's on the lower side, but the infiltration, it's really low. So we have a half inch infiltration rate per minute and the total year uh, yield of dry matter production is 2.1 tons of dry matter per acre per year. So it may look nice, but it's not as productive as it can be. This other picture, I want to show you a native prairie system where we focused on, on building diversity. So it's the same type of grasses plus some more. So it's still smooth brome, just as the previous picture, but on that smooth brown that is invasive in this ecosystem, we also have an array of different forbs, legumes, warm season perennials, some annuals in there, and, and look at the, at the density of the growth. Now it looks like it might get away from you, it's already gone to seed, but still that pasture provides a, a much healthier plane of nutrition for, for your animals. This soil has 8% soil organic matter. It has an infiltration rate of six inches of moisture per minute. 
So it's not how much moisture you get, it's what you do with that moisture. So if we increase the carbon in the soil, we can retain more moisture and we can extend our growing period. And you're going to be having your animals grazing in those pastures, healthier grass for a longer amount of time. Now, in terms of production in this system, well, we measured it to be 10.8 tons of dry matter per acre per year. So it's a sig significant increase. This is a picture of how it's grazed afterwards. And, and look at all the soil armor that you're really putting into, into the soil. So we had to change the way we think and, and to see this amount of, of residue, the armoring the soil that we leave behind, we have to stop looking at it as wasted forage. Because really, it is not wasted. You're adding into your soil fertility bank account. And a healthier soil is going to improve nutrient cycling and is going to improve the quality of your forage. If we look at the soil at this site, I want you to look at the change in the in the color. Now we start seeing uh, macro aggregation. Look at those clumps like cottage cheese. That's what you want to see in a healthy soil. If you smell this soil is earthy, you have a lot of roots protruding through it. You have uh, you don't see any compaction layers on it. So this this type of soil has more pore space for it to have better water infiltration better water retention, and also it has a lot of uh, empty airspace because uh, the soil organisms that we need to drive nutrient cycling need oxygen. So we can build diversity into our pastures. This was uh, the same place as from the first picture of the monoculture, and all it needed was a change of how we graze those pastures. It needed some recovery. And the moment we allow that recovery to happen, then we start seeing new species starting to show up. In this case, an excessive amount of clovers came up. So you have to be careful. Most people are gonna run into this problem. It's still not a very healthy system. If we have a, an excess of nitrogen or legume plants in our pastures, or if we have grass that is very young and tender, and it's really high in protein, that's going to change the way that our animals digest the feed, and it changes the, the microflora of, of the rumen of that animal. And that excess protein is going to change the pH of that animal, and it's going to have problems. That's where you're going to start seeing pink eye, foot rot, and other array of illnesses manifest on the animal. It is not because of seed heads or the height of the grass or the flies. Uh, it is really that the animal it is not able to cope with those situations because it has a nutritional imbalance. So their food, you know, our, our mothers and teachers were right when we were kids. We are what we eat. And for our animals, it is much the same way. Now here we're trying to feed the soil so we can grow better plants, so we can grow healthier animals. So we have to focus on the soil. And that's where adaptive stewardship plays a major role. How we manage these pastures is gonna dictate what grows in them. So I didn't want my cows to gorge on all that excess nitrogen. So I came in with a lighter grazing and I trampled a great amount of that forage. Again, it was not wasted grass because the response that I got in this picture, you can see the manure patties. So we went from a system that was fertilizer dependent. We went, we reduced we completely eliminated uh, nitrogen fertilization that same year, and that the manure patties have a different color. Now that change in color should excite you. That means that we had a broken system. Nutrient cycling on the on those pale spots indicate that the grass is not healthy. 
the change in color just by adding that carbon into the soil, into the system. Now we have a, a plant that is growing with more vigor. It has different colors. And well, I assure you that it has a higher nutritional value. That's what we want. This was just with one treatment. So if you do this, even in one year, you can see very significant impacts. So let's talk about how closely we want to graze our animals. We always want to, you always see those pictures of regenerative ranchers using electric fence to increase the stock density. And that's because the closer you can have your animals together, the more control you have on the grazing aspect of things. You would not be able to leave this amount of a residue if you just open up the gate and let them graze everywhere you want. If we concentrate the grazing and we can concentrate the, the manure distribution, you're going to achieve better results much quicker. Otherwise, it will take longer for uh, the manure to completely fill out the empty spots. This is a picture of Bermuda grass. So Bermuda grass is notorious for not being as nutritious as it is. But if you focus on soil health, I took a picture of the of the bricks reading of that pasture. This is before the growing season, the picture at the bottom. And a month later, I received two inches of rainfall, so I already got significant regrowth. Some of that grass was already going into seed. That's because it's a warm season perennial grass on a healthy system. It's going to want to seed very quickly. It still wasn't ready for cattle, but I went out and I measured it anyways. And we had a bricks measurement of about 14 degrees. That it's a uh, mid range. I think you can get a lot better and it, it has over time. But in a degraded system, this same scenario, I would assure you that with this type of grass, the, the quality and the nutritional content of it would have been much slower. You usually would have seen a bricks context that could have been way below 10, probably closer to five or six degrees only. Now, as you start resting your pastures, it's inevitable that you're going to see weeds. And I love Ray Archuleta's definition of what is a weed. He says, a weed, it's a plant for what we do not know what it is good for. That's exactly what a weed is. We, we don't know what, a, what it brings to the table, so we call it a nuisance. Now, there are some weeds that are poisonous, and there's a way that you can go about it. But if you have a diverse pasture, and you're not forcing your cattle, and you're not starving them, they will leave those plants alone. Cattle have the amazing ability to select the forage that it needs. So weeds serve a purpose. They are, are there to armor the soil. It's a primary succession species. They have a strong tap root that help with compaction. More than likely, that's the reason why you're seeing weeds. So they're not a problem. They're there because of a reason. So. The reason is that you have a degraded system and the first things that you're going to see first are weeds. Now weeds, you can see them as a problem or an opportunity. Weeds and healthy pastures contain various essential minerals, vitamins, fatty acids, and phytonutrients. Some of the phytonutrients are these fancy words I can barely pronounce, flavonoids, phenolytic compounds, carotenoids, alkaloids, whatever those fancy words are. In, in short, basically they are antioxidants. Some of them have anti-inflammatory um, health benefits. They are, some of those um, compounds are good for the heart and the, and the health of the animals, and they increase the immune system for those animals. The problem is that, like I mentioned, is when we start forcing our animals to eat 
out of necessity because we are mismanaging and they overeat certain species, then they start getting sick. Weeds and, and diverse Pasture mixes are, are beneficial only when they are allowed to select their own diet. That's why on feedlots we tend to see a greater incidence of illness because we do not know best. Cattle know best and we ought to learn on how those cattle and, and other animals um, graze and we should be more observant. So how do we get our, our animals to, to eat those weeds? You know, Some of these animals have never been exposed to a lot of these forages and other grass species. You have to know that it, there's two aspects to this problem. One is that it's the soil aspect of it, the soil health and the plant species behind it. The, how mature those plants are, so the growth cycle. And then there's also the behavioral aspect of your animals. If they've never been exposed to those plants, how do you expect them to utilize them? It's no different than making your kids eat their vegetables. Now, if you force them to eat these plants, you can run into trouble. But if you give them a very balanced diet, animals will, by instinct, are able to, to smell those, those nutrients from the plants, those phytonutrients, and they are able to select their diet. This is where allowing them to be somewhat selective is not that bad of a thing. We cannot just say one fancy word and say that we have to focus on a management one certain way because we might not understand the situation of what's happening. That's why adaptive grazing provides the tool to make better decisions that are aligned with nature. So this is Canadian thistle. Cattle will, will graze some of it if it's in a young, tender stage, but they might leave it alone if they don't know what it is. So I had a very dense spot here and I just decided to use some positive encouragement and I threw a salt block right up there where I wanted them to one trample it, but something very, very interesting happened. So uh, you put one salt block, that's all it took. A lot of the cows went there and licked the salt, they trampled the weeds and, and they tasted some of that, those weeds. And I have here this video, when I did the next pasture change, the first thing those cattle did is go all the way to the top where those darker spots are, where that's where those weeds were coming down from the mountain. They were just, the seeds are coming from the national forest. They were coming down to this property. And cattle instinctively went up there now seeking those plants. So we, we have to reteach our animals sometimes how to be animals, but we cannot do it in a way that we're forcing them to do so. Kind of have to do Jedi mind tricks on them and, and make really make it think that it was their idea. Alternate sources of nutrition. So there's a lot of plants out there that we just see them as a nuisance. Here we have some cactus. In another picture, I have prickly pear. We have mesquite, we have brush, everything has thorns. You know, we see, they are a nuisance to walk about through them, but that doesn't mean that they don't bring something to the ecosystem. And here you can see that cattle actually were finding it quite enjoyable. Maybe they thought it was a bit spicy. And look at the amount of residue I'm leaving behind. So it was, it still got trampled a great deal and put some armor back onto the ground. You cannot force your animals to graze that way. If you do so, you're going to run into problems. You need to have the right management behind it. You need to have the right genetics. And that's where epigenetics come into play. Epigenetics is nothing but the gene expression uh, by the environmental factors that those animals are exposed. 
So within their DNA, if you have good genetics, you know, how you manage will determine if those genes will be manifested or not. And that's why it's really important that we try to do things the right way. Otherwise, we're going to ruin our animals. And this is an, uh, one clear example of what exceptional epigenetics can do. These young bulls are actually grazing a um, prickly pear. That is a nasty cactus. It has a, a barb thorn at the end of it that once you get it in, it's really difficult to get out. You can see that some of them, they have it in their mouths, but they're browsing on it. And some other animals are browsing on it, and then they're going, picking up some grass. There's some uh, a bull that is green, uh, eating some old stale grass, is balancing its diet. And there's going to be another picture right here at this bull underneath the brush, the mesquite tree. It's eating something else differently. So the more diversity we have in the system, the animals are able to balance their diet. And that's when you start seeing them consuming those other species that otherwise they would have been left ungrazed. Another positive uh, aspect of adapted stewardship is that as you spend time with your animals, you know, they are healthy, are hormonally balanced, so they're not nervous, they're not running around, uh, they're used to seeing you. Every time you change them from a pasture, they know that they're going somewhere else better, and they start communicating to you. So this is me. Uh, just a few weeks after working with this group of animals. And that's how I'm changing them pastures. They just, they start bonding with you. Now, a lot of them were not following me at that point. That's all right. We we're just getting started. All I needed is that one cow. And after a few weeks, they just wanted to be with me. It didn't matter where I was on the pasture. They always came to me. It all was thanks to that, that beautiful heifer. Now, never name your, your cows, but her name was Ramona. Yes, never do that. But let me show the, the video again. I mean, they're calm. None of them are bawling. Yeah, there's some flies, but we're still fixing that system. And they, this is what adaptive stewardship is all about. Taking care of the land, taking care of the animals, and the animals seeing you as a caretaker. If your animals don't want to be with you, I'm, I hate to tell you, but I trust cattle better than people. And if you invite me to your place, uh, I will judge you by how your animals be, <laughs> react to you. So careful when you show me your cows. That same group, a few months later, Changing pastures is a breeze. So not only you have healthier animals, but those are animals are easier to manage. Why wouldn't you want to do this? Not a single one of them are, is balling. They all know where they're going. They're fat as ticks. And no supplement, no inputs, no protein tub, nothing is given to them except proper grazing management. There's another aspect to this. So we we have to manage in a way so that we allow animals to to behave properly because a lot of them might not know how to properly graze and that has to do with the transfer of knowledge that they have. You know, we I think we underestimate the intelligence of of our animals. Cattle are very intelligent creatures, and they they transmit that knowledge um, when you are running them together as a group. You know, there's a hierarchy in the herd. The older animals will teach the young ones what what plant species to graze, when to graze them, uh, where to lay down, where to shelter, and that really adds to adaptability. 
So if you have animals transferring knowledge generation to generation, then you have very adaptive cattle that are resilient and they'll do most of the work for you. This is a first time cow with a seven and a half month old calf. I mean, a lot of people want to uh, wean them early to help the cow, but uh, a good productive animal with strong epigenetics can rear a calf of this size with no inputs and look at the condition of that cow. Does it look like she needs to be weaned? You know, I've, I've done continuous calving, control calving, uh, and I've let calves run with their mothers for longer periods of time. And I, after a while, form follows function and how you manage will detect a lot of those epigenetics that you put into your herd and it all adds up into adding that adaptability back into your herd so you want the animals to work for you not you for them this is uh, at my place this is uh i took this video last week so i've been in a d4 drought for almost two years last time i got any decent rainfall was in two, 2022 on august last year i only got three quarters of an inch and I want you to notice, one, the quality of the forage is pretty poor, but I still have some two-year-old stockpile grass on the hills of those mountains. But I want you to look at the herd behavior. All those animals are leaving water to, and are going grazing together as a group without anybody pushing them, anybody driving them. So as you... You build this system and, and you improve your pastures and your cattle become calm and, and you build that adaptability and transfer of knowledge. Then you start seeing that cattle in within their instinct, they are migratory. But we have to allow that to happen. That's what instinctive migratory grazing is all about. That's the end of, of my presentation. Um, I think it's time for some Q&A. Very good, Fernando. Thank you so very much. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Kent Solberg. I'm with Understanding Ag. I'm a colleague of Fernando's, and it's a great pleasure to work with him. We also have Jeremy Sweeten on, who's another one of our colleagues. And then we have Kyle Richardville on as well as Leanne Oliver, who was introduced earlier. So um, we've asked that you type your questions in the chat. I have a couple questions here just to get things rolling. Um, Fernando, and, and again, anybody else jump in if they wanna comment. Um, so what are some, Fernando, you took a scoop of shovel in the soil. You were looking at a few things there. What are some other simple things I can do to monitor progress in my soils as I'm moving down this direction as a farmer. You know, plant species biodiversity, uh, infiltration tests, you can do soil tests. Uh, just the shovel is the most sophisticated tool you can have in your arsenal. Just feel that soil, smell it, walk around your pasture. If it feels tough, then you know you got compaction. It, it, it's, it's not that hard. I think the hardest part is to take the time to to observe. Um, look for insects. We want to combat weeds and 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 insects, but if you start spraying, you also kill a lot of the beneficials uh, of insects are within that system. So take a look around and see what's happening. Very good. Anybody else want to add to that? Jeremy, Kyle, Leanne. All right, good. Uh, how would a, so a long history, a person has a long history of using fertilizers on the farm, whether that's manures or synthetics, how does that fit into this? How do we make that, or do we not use that anymore? Do we just drop it and, and go without? What, what are your thoughts there? All right, so how you wean yourself off from these products, uh, it's, 
very context dependent. You can definitely go cold turkey, but attend to the consequences. Know that your system is not ready for that yet. You have to, to wean yourself off slowly. Now you can do it cold turkey, but the consequences are that you're going to have less production that year. It might take longer for, for those plants to recover, or you might, um, the quality will be also lower and you're going to need more water as well. So those are the consequences. If you can afford to do that, great. I suggest you progressively just start using less off because there's a, the soil health aspect of things and there's also your animals adaptability and genetics behind everything. And you have to, to slowly make that change. Anyone else want to add to that? All right, just, go ahead. I was just going to speak to that real quick. Um, other One other thought is to encourage folks to do test strips as they build their comfort level with weaning themselves from synthetics or manure. So you need to fit your context and your comfort level. Mm -hmm. Very good. So um, Fernando, you showed a number of pictures with a high degree of trample in there as a farmer or rancher do i do i need that degree of trample on every acre every year every time i graze or what what am what am i looking at here what are we thinking about here as, as on individual farms obviously the the more you can put back into the system the better it's how much you can afford to do so you have to take a close look at how much biomass you're anticipating and also what your your stocking rate will be. So what's that that demand of forage that you require? If you see that you are barely getting through with what you have, then that should be a strong indication that you might be overstocked to begin with. Uh, usually that's the case. And if you want to progress fast, sometimes you just have to take a, a step backwards a little bit and allow that system to heal. And then you get to where you want to be much quicker than if you try you to wheel yourself from the start. Now, the moment you start rotating your pastures, you will be surprised that actually you, you will have a, an excess amount of forage available if you did things right. But just because you see that improvement, don't try to, to grace it all off again. Uh, I really uh, advise you to put more back to the system as much as you can, and that will get you faster to go where you want to be. Very good. Other thoughts from anybody else on the panel? All right, excellent. Um, so how do I know, you kind of hinted on this already, how do I know if my recovery period is long enough? Yes, uh, you'll hear a lot of things out there that, oh, it's when you start to seeing plants to go to seed, and that's not necessarily true. Plants sometimes will want to bolt and go to seed when there's stress, especially if you're getting into a drought situation. Uh, I would really just look at the physiological state of the plant and see how much biomass is putting out there. Uh, going, looking for that seed head trying to come up, that's a good indication. But it don't base it off just on that. Uh, take into account these other factors, the climatic factors as well. Okay, anyone else want to jump in? All right, say Jake, I don't know if my chat is working correctly here. It seems to have stalled out. I was going to say, Kent, we've got some questions piling up. Do you mind if I start you reading them go, if you can't uh, see Mine them? seems to be locked up, so if oh, you okay, got them, Kyle, I'll go them. ahead. Yes, I okay. can see them. Yeah, and I know Fernando has to go at maybe the top of the hour or whatever. So, uh, okay. Fernando, the first question from Danielle, she asks, Fernando, why did you scrap your grazing plan, the one you created on your 24-hour flight? Was the plan created the plan created by the Savory Network? Did it not fit your context? If so, why? No, no. Uh, first, understand that it is not a plan issue. Planning is essential when going into war. The thing is that we do not control environmental factors that surround that plan that you base it all upon a, uh, an idea that you had at the time that you wrote it. So conditions are ever-changing. 
There was nothing wrong with holistic, nothing wrong with the plan itself. That's just part of the process. And if you understand holistic management, that, it, that is the whole essence of it. It's that planning, uh, executing, adjusting, and replanning again. Uh, but a lot of people fall into that, that mistake of wanting to think in a system. And it's not a system. It's really adaptive by nature. And you have to become adaptive, not just in your grazing plan, but in your business model, in your marketing, in everything, every single aspect, even on how you manage the people that work with you. So I think don't get hung up if your plan didn't work. It's what you do about it that really matters. It's how you're going to adapt to that situation. Thanks, Fernando. The next one is from Catherine. She asks, what is your typical stocking rate per acre? Well, when I first started, first of all, there's not one magic number. So we always we always think that there's a perfect stocking rate or a one carrying capacity that you got to strive for. It's ever changing. It changes year after year. It changes throughout the year and it will be different on each single pasture. And you'll be surprised <laughs> if you're paying attention. But I started off with, uh, we started with 135 acres per head and we brought it down to 30 acres per head. But then again, you know, when you don't get rainfall for two years, uh, really I'm, I'm running on my stockpile. So I always, I'm always leaving room for the worst case scenario. So I, if I wanted to graze it all that year, Heck, I could have run probably 15 acres uh, per head, but now I would have had nothing in the system and I would have had to sold out uh, a year ago. So I'm running into my second year of a drought here, still with animals, still with a healthy system. So what's that number for you that is going to lower your operating risk? That's the number you should strive for. Thank you. Anybody else? Good. OK, next one. Mike asks a very good question. He asks, if you're starting with arid ground with little grass cover, how do you start to regenerate the growth as there is insufficient grass to support the cattle to start with? If it, there's not enough plant biomass there to begin with, um, I think it's really important to get that animal trampling action going first, because as you start breaking the soil crust, uh, you start disturbing the system and you really begin to, to possibly benefit the water cycle. Now, ideally, I would want to have as much biomass there as I can, but it's kind of it's kind of like what's first, the chicken or the egg? And, and it's neither, you know, you have to build them both as you go along. So if you have very little biomass, I would be very mindful of how many head of cattle I'm trying to run. I would still try to aim for leaving as much behind, but more than likely you're going to be grazing a, a significant amount of that biomass just to get the, the trampling action. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I remember when I took the holistic management course, one of the videos that was most impactful for me, he drew three rectangles in the soil, Alan Savory did, and he just poured water on one without doing anything. The second one he chipped, and then the second one he chipped and then put grass cover over it. And and I think he waited a day. And the first one, it was all evaporated. It looked like nothing had been done. Second one had some more moisture and the third one had the most moisture, so. Yeah, so getting that animal impact, it's crucial. And then you want to build that system. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Ian asks, would you over sow pastures with, say, legumes, for example, by feeding hard seeds to your animals? Yes, you can seed by feeding on your mineral supplementation, uh, whatever you want to put in there. Smaller seeds will are more likely to get through the digestive tract without being uh, uh, utilized by the animal. I think it's very effective in the sense that whenever that seed lands, it lands in I think Fernando froze up on my end. Is that? Froze up. 
Yep. Yeah, we could take it from here, Kyle. So, yeah, uh, you can feed small hard seeds through your mineral program. That's certainly an option. Uh, be careful that you're using seeds that are not treated. Um, that seed, when it comes out, it's going to land in a very good environment, that cow patty, just like Fernando was saying. Uh, another option, if you are doing some solid pack manure hauling, is uh, throw a couple liters of a uh, liter or two of uh, hard seed like that on top of the manure spreader with every load. Uh, that can be another option to do it. It's cheap. You're accomplishing two tasks at once, and so that can be an option. But first, look look at what's there. You know, what's your context? Where what are your goals? Where do you want to go? We may have a lot of night or uh, legumes out there, but what we typically see when we're working with pastures is probably way too high a percentage of legumes. I know we've been pushed that direction for many, many years to have that, but too much nitrogen in the system creates its own set of problems, not only for the soil, but also for our animal, animal um, health and nutrition. Jeremy, you got anything you want to add to that or Leanne? The the other thing I like to do is even give a certain percentage of the paddock or paddocks an extended rest period and see what seeds germinate. In my context, northern Michigan, um, that could be 90 days. So, you know, always go back to what that soil seed bank has to offer as well. Leanne, I saw you turned your camera on. Did you have something to say? Yeah, just a couple of things on the, the nitrogen situation that, you know, excess nitrogen that's not matched with energy in any diet is is wasteful. You know, it's the production of urea, blood urea levels um, are elevated and that's what um, was mentioned before in terms of change of blood pH and that has substantial health consequences and, and it was mentioned previously, things like power on the foot and, and pink eye as a result. So we we'll have to be careful with that and I think the pictures that were shown as well where that you know, red clover just set away, those animals won't be used to grazing that and they'll go in there and think that that's lollipops and sweeties and, and off they'll go. So the risk of, of bloat and an unbalanced diet for the untrained animal is probably pretty significant too. So just got to go, go, go careful. Thank you. So we had a question specifically for Fernando in managing and brittle environments. Does anybody feel confident enough to take it or should we wait to see if maybe he logs back on? Ken, I'd have to read it here, but. So Silas asked, I was wondering how you manage your pasture utilization, post graze residuals and animal impact across different seasons. The UK climate is very different from yours. I personally manage pasture very differently in spring, summer, autumn and winter. I'm interested to understand how best to manage in a brittle, brittle management. I'll take a little stab at that. It may not be Fernando's personal experience or what he's doing, but I'm glad to hear, Silas, that you're changing your management throughout the seasons. That's excellent to hear. Um, I, I think having worked with Fernando and others from the Chihuahuan Mexican area than other people in brittle environments, keeping that soil covered, keeping armor on the soil, long rest periods, very, very critical. And, and that's a key focus because um, we've gone out in understanding ag many times with a digital readout thermometer and taken soil temperatures on uncovered soil, literally less than a meter away from where there's shade. And we can have huge fluctuations or huge changes in soil surface temperatures. And that's extremely important. When our soil surface temperatures, and I apologize, I don't have the the uh, Celsius conversion here, and so I'm going to have to speak in Fahrenheit, so you'll have to do your own math or your own conversion, but uh, I, I'm just using these numbers because of the ones I know in my head, but at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the microbes are extremely comfortable. Um, when we get to 100 degrees, they start getting stressed. We have very high evaporation transpiration rates from our soil. Uh, up to 85% of the water can be evaporating or transpiring from that system. At 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, we're starting to have lethal impacts on those microbes. In Even in non-desert environments, even in, in the Canadian provinces, we have measured soil surface temperatures uh, in excess of 100, 155 degrees on a warm summer's day where there's bare soil with the sun shining. And we can move over just literally a meter and go in the shade and can be a lot less. And so 
by protecting those microbes, by keeping that soil covered, by reducing that evapotranspiration rate out there, we're building a lot of resiliency in our system. And in a brittle environment, that's extremely huge. And then getting more carbon back in that system to help feed that system that requires a living plant, that requires some degree of trample out there in order to make that happen. Thanks, Kent. Now, Leanne, I'll flip the question now. We've been in a historically wet climate here in the UK. How how have you seen producers or even yourself change management in an extremely wet season throughout the seasons? Yeah, I think um, just to carry on from Kent's point there about the you know the, the hot soil temperatures, it, it, clearly that implicates the cattle that graze in those areas as well. Heat stress and and is a huge huge implication for fertility and animal production. So in well armoured covered soils they're not going to get the radiating heat from that it's crucial that the, the cover is there and I think that's the same um, certainly in, in, in cattle production within the UK really hot stressy summers we see a lot of infertile bulls a lot of cows not showing bulling behaviour bulls not interested in going to find the cows because they're just too hot um, but some of the, the big blood vessels of animals are on the inside of their legs and, and underneath their belly big milk, milk veins and if we can keep um, good cover on the pastures and that area is cool then we keep those animals a lot cooler they don't necessarily need trees and, and shade to go and find shelter if they can be cooled from underneath and they can lay down on cool ground then that makes a huge difference so I think that's something we can be aware of during our summer months and certainly you guys in the states and, and Mexico that's a whole other level I think for the ground being so wet over here just now I think the, the frequency of the moves and the adaptability of that is crucial um, and I think being able to use disruptions is, is crucial, but also not to have paddocks lined in the same direction all the time. So therefore, we're not using the same gateways and putting animals back through where other animals have been um, in quick succession. So for those guys that have got sheep knocking around, you know, it's been really, really wet this winter. Sheep outside, sheep lameness at the minute is a huge issue. Um, but a sheep's worst enemy is another sheep and every sheep's got four <laughs> feet. So if they're checking through the same gateway three or four times a day or, you know, in quick succession, even in a rotation, then that's going to manifest those problems. So I think we just need to have a risk managed, managed system, which is kind of what Fernando was saying in terms of how brittle and how dry his farm was, that, you know, we can't push the boundaries because, you know, he needs to have a reserve there. We almost need to think of that the other way that, you know, how much stock can we carry in the area we've got? If we're going to have a really wet winter, we need to do successive moves and we haven't got the, the dry matter ahead of them, then we need to you know make sure we've got a plan B and just not be too too greedy um, and, and make sure that we've got a contingency measures in place. Well, just a comment about one of the benefits of moving down through adaptive stewardship and, and what you'll see in your pastures is as we build that soil aggregation that was lacking in that one pasture that Fernando showed the, the shovel the shovel test from, as we build that, um, we build traffic ability, the ability of those paddocks to handle traffic, whether it's wet, whether, you know, during a dry period, that's going to capture and store your moisture. During a wet period, that's going to be able to handle the animal traffic traffic more than a, a, a paddock or a pasture that has no soil aggregate structure in it. So this is one of the long-term benefits we can look forward to. I think that's quite obvious driving around the the British countryside, certainly in the northeast of England just now, there, there is fields that are holding up and they've been grazed in a completely different manner to, to the set stock and, um, that, that we see also commonly. Hmm. There's a phrase that Fernando said, he said, form follows function. And I think it goes in the reverse, function follows form. And so not only is that with our livestock, but it's in our soil. The aggregate is the basic unit of a healthy, well, managed soil. So when we have that aggregation and we have that organic matter, that carbon sponge, you know, in his in Fernando's environment, that helps hold the water for when he needs it because it's so dry, right? We don't want it to evaporate. But also in the wet environments, it holds it like a sponge, like Kent was saying, so it can squeeze and then return back to its form. And that's how we can sneak more days, getting out earlier in the spring and staying later in the fall and having those soils hold up. So I lived in the semi-arid region of Texas for a little bit. And then now I'm here in the UK with you guys. So it's really cool to see the answer is the same in, in both environments. It's getting carbon in the soil and aggregating that soil structure. 
All right. I think it's the last question I see. Uh, SJ asks, how would you manage the grazing or paddocks for undesirable species? So, yeah, that's, as Fernando said, is it undesirable because of an aesthetic thing? Is it undesirable because of a legal thing? Is it undesirable because it's a noxious plant? Um, I think asking those questions first, is it truly undesirable? Usually it's there because of something we've done or something that has happened and it's taking advantage of that opportunity. It's also trying to help uh, restore or repair itself. Nature wants to do that. Nature abhors a vacuum and so it's going to fill it with something and how long it's there and how prevalent it is is going to be related to our management. So Fernando had a, a, a neat little trick I've used many, many times and that's putting a salt or a mineral block or a mineral feeder uh, in the middle of that patch. Um, in fact, we're wrapping up a research project with a university here, and I'm in Minnesota, part of the United States here, and we did a number of these things um, to try and address uh, some invasive plants that the public land management agency wanted to address, and so we would do something to make that area attractive to bring animals in there for a short period of time. We also used what was called a paddock or what is called a paddock within a paddock. And with polywire and step in posts, we can, you know, delineate those areas. And what I encourage folks to do is if there's an area like that, that you want to change the vegetative composition, is that I, I, I like to prioritize them around the pasture. And as I come to those or I see it coming up, I make time to delineate a small paddock within my bigger paddock that I need to meet my animals' nutritional needs and will turn them into that paddock for a short period of time. It can be as short as 20 minutes uh, that they're in something like that. I've done as long as six hours, which I wouldn't recommend unless some very specific things were in place. And then they were allowed to go into the larger paddock that they need to meet their nutritional needs for those next 24 or 48, whatever you're doing hours, but that high stock density is going to put stress on that plant, knowing when that plant is the most va uh, vulnerable to impact or disturbance. And that's typically right when a seed head is forming. It's also when the plant is the most nutritious. So you may accomplish a couple of things. You may train them to actually like this plant in small amounts, but you're also putting stress on that plant when that plant is putting a large portion of its in energy and nutritional needs of that plant up above ground. Now we're going to trample it flat. We're going to stress that plant out and then giving it adequate rest and monitoring what happens can be a great way to do that. And over time, we should start seeing a reduction uh, in the number of these under, undesirables, or our cattle may learn that they like it and they eat it, and that's okay, as long as it's part of the bigger array of the uh, salad bar, if you will, that we offer out there for them. Yeah, that's very interesting, Kent. Um, I know a common practice that I've run into with many producers is wanting to to top, to mow those, let's say, thistles before they get to seed because they're worried about increasing the, the seed bank. Um, and what you're saying kind of goes uh, in contrast to that. Uh, what would you say to someone in that practice of topping? Yeah, topping. It's interesting. There's actually some research coming out of the states here about topping and showing it's just not cost effective. And by simply changing how we manage our animal, we're, we should be out there anyway, managing our animals and managing our pasture. And if we can accomplish, uh, you know, uh, two things at once, boy, how efficient is that? You know, we always talk about efficiency, labor efficiencies in the farm, and it can be a great way to go. If we're firing up machinery, if we're hooking up an implement, if we got to pay for labor out there, that gets expensive and, and research in the States here is showing that that's really not much of an ROI, a good ROI. It may look as aesthetic, aesthetically nice for that season, but if is it truly resolving the problem if we're having to go back year after year after year and doing that? It's the same thing with herbicides. You know, I used to get paid 40 years ago to go out and spray with herbicide and i could probably take you back to those same patches that were sprayed it's still there it doesn't exist the overall management hasn't changed you know if if some of these things were to fix quote fix some of these things that we perceive our problems or have been trained to believe our problems um 
that problem would have been resolved a long time ago, but here we are decades later and there's, they still exist there. So what are we doing to change our management and altering our management? And, and sometimes a small amount of those things, it's not a problem, especially if the cattle are eating them, um, unless there's some legal issue that requires us uh, to take care of that. And usually if it's in small amounts, it's just not a problem, even from a legal standpoint, because nobody's truly eradicating these things. We're just learning how to live with them and, and, and keep them uh, at a tolerable level. Thanks, Kent. I don't know if anybody has other thoughts on that or not. I'll just add, um, I was I was with the producer, oh, a couple months ago, and well, maybe it was last fall by now. But anyway, they were they had this field that they were topping. It was full of thistles. They just could not get rid of it, and so and so coincidentally, they had just planted a new hedgerow and they had roped it off, and it had been growing for a couple of years. And I took them over there, and there was one thistle and there were all kinds of di this diversity of plants from this two years rest. And so those thistles, you know, they were living in community with that increased diversity of plants. And that was really cool to see because it was literally just a, a wire <laughs> separating this, this, uh, but a change in management. Yeah. And a very different response. Yes. Right. So I just wanted to say one thing, Jake, I know it's our, we're up against the clock. Um, for everyone oh, good, in the audience, yeah. for everyone in the audience, Jeremy Sweeten um, has just done an excellent webinar on bale grazing. Is that right, Jeremy? Right. And so for anybody that's thinking about doing that, um, I know a lot of producers have asked about increasing diversity in their pastures and doing that through diverse seeds and through bale grazing is a good option. So maybe Jeremy could say just a little something about that. Um. Kent and I did the, the presentation together and tried to cover a wide range of, of topics of high density, low density bale grazing. Um, and one of the things we talked about was, was feeding hay, whether you're setting a bale on the problem area or unrolling hay where you wanna add fertility and maybe change the, the micro ecosystem right there with the impact of that hay. So back to your weed issues, maybe you can unroll some hay on it and let the livestock trampling action and the increased fertility change that situation as well. So but we go through quite a few um, different things in the bale grazing um, presentation, but mostly trying to kickstart that cycle. And then at the end of the presentation, there's a lot of good question and answers from across um, our, our breadth of um, customers. Thanks, Jeremy. Fantastic. Well, yeah, Kent, Jeremy, Leanne, Carl, and I don't know if Fernando's not on the call that anymore, but a, a big thanks also to him um, for your time this evening. That was really, really interesting. Um, as I said at the start, we've recorded this, so we'll be sure to send through a recording to you in, in the next few days. Um, but yeah, thanks very much and, and have a good rest of your evening, everybody. And good rest of your day over in the US. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, folks. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.